Enjoying the good and forbid the evil In near to the clear and far away If it's unknown, it's based on knowledge, gentleness, and patience Let's work on the quick things and get it to the next level Enjoying the good and forbid the evil In near to the clear and far away If it's unknown, it's based on knowledge, gentleness, and patience Let's work on the quick things and Email Hamdudi La Wasalat Wasalamala Wadrasulala. I want to welcome everybody to the first session of this new series entitled And Joining the Good and Forbidding the Evil. And the reason why I came up with this uh, series is because, alhamdulillah, there is so much information that you guys are learning here at Sunnah Followers. Uh, alhamdulillah, the fitra of your hearts uh, have been has been awakened. And many of you are so uh, content within yourself because now you have rediscovered what your purpose in life is. You have redefined what the ultimate goal is for yourself. And you are you have this strong connection with a law that you hadn't had before. And being excited about it, you want to share it with others. You want to share it with the people you care about, your family, your friends, the Muslims in your community. However, that's what leads to the question, how do we go about sharing the true knowledge that we have gained about Islam with others, especially being that most people think that they already know their religion. Uh, we're living in the days of fitin that our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us against. You know, uh, most people, all none of us as human beings like to be told that we don't understand something. None of us like to be corrected. So this is where the problem lies. You know, your intentions may be good. You may really want to, uh, you know, have all the good intentions in the world, but the delivery just doesn't come out right. I don't care how well you sugarcoat it. Nobody likes to be told that they're going to hell. Nobody likes to be told that they're committing a sin because when you tell a person that they're committing a sin, that's basically what you're telling them, that if they don't correct it, they're going to go to hell because that's the reality. And there's no sweet way of, of telling a person that. So that's why I'm doing this series. Because as Muslims, we are all obligated to enjoy the good and forbid the evil with ourselves, with each other. But there's a certain criteria we have to follow. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us how to do it the best way so as not to cause harm so as not to cause more damage than good. And so we're gonna embark upon this journey together. And it's gonna probably take us a month or so to go over uh, this, uh, this title. But mashallah, today I'm gonna start it off as an introduction. You know, I'm gonna introduce you all, especially uh, the new shahadas to what enjoining good and what forbidding evil really means it for us as, as, as Muslims. So let me put the, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen and then we can get started. Okay, and I'll begin with the sharing of the people here in my Zoom room. Yeah, okay. And I do have the PowerPoint right here. Here it is, thank God. Because I sure messed up earlier with it. 
Pull this out the way. Okay, for everybody on Facebook and YouTube and other social platforms, here we go. I'm getting ready to share with you guys. There it is. And by the way, guys, please support this DAWA effort. We are a nonprofit organization. We are desperately, desperately, desperately in need of donations. It's the middle of the month, almost the end of the month. And we are short money to help pay our expenses. You know, we need at least about 500 more dollars, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah. So please, guys, anybody that can make a $500 donation to cover this month's expenses, because I'm assuming what's left is uh, uh, Zoom and a couple of other programs. Please donate, uh, make a $500 donation if you're able to, because that'll take us through the rest of this month. Okay, so let's put... Um, I don't know what this is. Okay, well, let's see. Here's my PowerPoint. I don't know what that was telling me I did. Okay, but anyway, see if I can carry on with my stuff. Okay, here we are, yeah. So today will serve as an introduction uh, to this series, to this topic. And by the way, uh, the simple fact that we enjoy the good and we forbid the evil, this is what makes us Muslims the best of all the other nations. This is what makes us better than the people who came before us. This is why we are the chosen people of today. And I'm going to explain this in today's introduction. First of all, Allah tells us this in the Quran. Where did I get that information from? From Allah. Allah says, in the interpretation of the meaning, he orders them with that which is good, and he forbids them from that which is evil. And he makes allowed for them everything that is clean and good. And he forbids them from everything that is unclean and bad. Uh, now, Allah is speaking about himself. He's letting us know that he perfected this religion for us. And this is why as Muslims, we have to be careful using the word haram. Because when you say something is haram, you're not just saying that it's unlawful, but you're also saying that that thing is bad and dirty. And that may not be true. Only Allah has the authority to determine what's bad for us. Only Allah has the authority to determine what's clean and good. For example, you brothers, you have to stop saying that makeup is haram because makeup is not haram. Allah didn't say that. Makeup is a good thing, okay? Makeup is clean. So stop saying it's haram. That's why the prophet said we can never use the word haram unless there is a clear nas or a clear verse that says whatever you're saying is haram. So if you brothers are going to tell Muslim women that it's haram for them to wear makeup, you have to bring the verse from the Quran where Allah says that, or the authentic hadith where the prophet said that. There is no such hadith. There is no such verse because makeup is good and clean. So be careful of that. And this is what makes our us better than the people before us. Because whatever we say that we can't do because it's unlawful, it means that that thing is bad. That thing is dirty. We can't take alcohol. Alcohol is bad and dirty. We cannot eat pork. It's bad and dirty for you. We cannot commit sex out of wedlock. Doing so is bad and dirty. These are examples and look at all the problems that we come and bar we that come upon us when we indulge in these things. 
So again, this verse of the Quran illustrates the per perfect me message that our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. He is the one upon whose tongue Allah has enjoined everything that's good. He is the one upon whose tongue Allah has told everything that's bad and dirty. And this is what the prophet meant when he said in the interpretation, the meaning I have been sent to complete the qualities of good character. In other words, the prophet came to tell us what's good and what's bad, how to act, how to behave, what to do, because the things he tells us to stay away from are all dirty, are all bad. And also he said in another hadith, my analogy in regards to the other prophets is like the analogy of a man who builds a house. He completed the house, perfected everything about it, except for the location of one brick, that one brick. And the people will walk past the house and say, wow, how beautiful that house is if it were not for that missing brick. He said, I am that brick. I am the seal of all the prophets. What did this mean? The prophet meant that of all the prophets that Allah sent, they were not able to complete their missions. There's a lot of things that Allah made unlawful for the children of Israel. There's a lot of things that Allah made unlawful for the followers of Moses, the followers of Jesus. Not because these things were bad, not because these things were dirty, but Allah made them unlawful for them as punishments. Listen to what Allah says and in the interpretation of the meaning. Because of some crimes committed by the Jews, we forbade them some things that were clean. And also, the message that all the other prophets brought had some things that were not clean. Allah says all food was once allowed to the children of Israel, except that which they chose to make unlawful for themselves before the sending down of the Torah. So these verses are the proofs, guys, that this is why the prophet is the missing brick of all the other prophets that came before him. The things that he told us that we cannot do are not punishments. We can't do them because they're bad for us. They'll cause problems. They'll cause harm to us. They're dirty, they're foul. We can't date. This is something that we want the Muslim kids to understand. You can't have a boyfriend. You can't have a girlfriend. Why? Because having a boyfriend is bad for you. It's dirty. It's foul. It leads to all kind of problems. Marriage is good. Marriage is clean. Marriage is better. So our way is the best way. And our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the missing brick of all the messages the other prophets came with, okay? So be careful using the word haram without evidence, clear evidence, because using the word haram, you're telling us we're doing something bad. And I want every Muslim listening to me to understand that Allah did not forget anything. He, Allah did not forget anything in this religion. He didn't have to tell you about um, a lipstick. The things that Allah doesn't mention are all lawful because most things in our everyday life is good and clean. So he didn't make a mistake by not mentioning lipstick. The fact that he did, didn't mention lipstick means it's good and clean, it's lawful. The fact that he didn't mention mascara is good and clean, it's lawful. 
The fact that he didn't say anything about a woman wearing pants means that pants are good and clean. They're lawful. Listen to what a law says and the interpretation of the meaning. On this day, I have perfected for you your religion and I have completed my favor upon you and I have chosen for you submission to me as your way of life. So Allah didn't make no mistakes by, by not mentioning things. He has perfected our way of life for us. And it's our job as Muslims to submit to him. That's what the word Islam means. Islam does not mean peace. Islam does not mean peace. Islam does not mean peace. Islam means total submission to Allah. Okay? Listen to what Allah says. So the Quran, he says, in the interpretation, the meaning, you, talking about us, the Muslims, you are the best nation brought forward for the people of the world. Why? Because you enjoin everything that's good and you forbid everything that's evil and you believe in Allah. So this is what separates us and differentiates us from the Jews and the Christians. That's why when you listen on the internet to these uneducated brothers talk about how we all worship the same God. No, we do not. When you hear these ignorant men compare Muslim women who dress properly to nuns, you're insulting us. We're nothing like the nuns. We don't worship the same Lord. We're nothing like the Christians and the Jews because they don't enjoin everything that's good and they don't forbid everything that's evil. We do, and they don't believe in Allah. So another reason why you have to be very careful who you're taking your knowledge of, of Islam from. Also, what separates us from the Christians and Jews is our wala, our allegiance to each other. Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, believing men and believing women are the protecting friends of each other. Why? Because we enjoin what's good and we forbid what's wrong. We remind each other. If I were sitting here on the internet, if I were to come in here and do my lecture and I had a piece of hair hanging out, the sisters would tell me, oh, Sister Layla, we can see your hair. Okay? The Christians don't do that to each other. If I saw a brother standing up drinking and then he goes to sit down, I'll tell him, you can stand. You can stand. That's an abrogated hadith. The hadith where the prophet forbade us from eating and drinking while standing, it's abrogated. So we remind each other. We advise each other. This is what makes us different and better than the other people. Again, in another hadith, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you are the best people for the people. You tie them in chains and shackles and drag them off to paradise. What does that mean? Because of our enjoining of the good, because of our forbidding of what's bad and dirty, the people have no choice but to follow us. So Allah explains to us that our nation is the best nation because we are the most beneficial to other people. The fact that we don't have sex out of wedlock, the non-Muslims cannot refute that. We're better. The fact that we don't do drugs and alcohol, we do live longer lives. The fact that we don't party all night long, is why we look younger. Why is it that the Muslims look younger? You take a woman my age, I am 63 years old. You put a non-Muslim woman next to me, put some of these Hollywood stars next to me. They don't look as good as me. They don't look as young as me. And I've never had Botox. I've never had plastic surgery. 
or any of that other crap that they get. You know, so no one can deny that our lifestyle as Muslims is better because everything that's unlawful for us to do is because it's bad, it's dirty, it'll destroy you. Okay. And again, the people that came before us, they didn't enjoy the good on everyone. They only did it with their friends. They only cared about those, their family members, those who were, are close to them. They didn't struggle in the way of a law like we do. When a law commanded the prophet and his companions to fight for his sake, to make Islam the religion of the land, they didn't hesitate. But when Allah told the Jews to enter them before they enter the promised land to go and, and run the people out that were there because they were bad, the Jews told Moses, no, you do that. You do it. We'll wait for you right here. So, you know, the people before us didn't struggle in the way of Allah. They didn't struggle with their with their with their um, um, uh, um, arms, nor did they struggle any other way. OK. Wait, hold on for one second. I ordered something as usual. Instacart, always when I'm teaching. Okay. Listen to what Allah, uh, what Allah says in the Quran about what happened with Moses. Moses told his people, oh, people, enter the sacred land that Allah has written for you and don't turn away. They said, oh, Moses, those people in there are belligerent. We will not enter until they leave. If they leave, then we'll enter it. They said, oh, Moses, you go, you and your Lord and fight them. We're going to sit right here and wait. That's the difference. That's the difference. They didn't struggle. They didn't take up arms and struggle for what's good. They didn't take up arms and struggle for what's clean, like we Muslims do. Even as like, for example, before I retired from work, I was a union steward. As a union steward and a paralegal, I had to represent non-Muslims. Just because they were non-Muslims didn't mean that I was to be, I would be unjust with them. I represented them to the best of my ability. I treated them the same way I would treat anyone else who was done wrongly, okay? That's what makes us different. Whereas the Jews will only show favoritism for their own. They won't enjoy what's good for everyone. And the Christians too, you got to be someone close to them. Also another example Allah gives us in the interpretation of the meaning. Did you not see the gathering of the sons of Israel after the time of Moses? When they told a prophet of theirs, raise up for us a king and then we'll go and fight in the way of Allah. And the, and the prophet told them, would you perhaps not fight if fighting were prescribed for you? They said, why would we not fight in the way of Allah? And we have been exiled from our homes and our children. And then when fighting was sent down and prescribed for them, instead of fighting, they all ran away except a few. So again, this is what makes them different than us. You know, talk. Talk is cheap. Okay, so we're not like that. Our nation is different. One thing about us Muslims, we may be all messed up today. You got the extreme right and the extreme left, the Carterjites, the Mutazala. But one thing about us, we will fight for what we think is right even though a lot of times we roam, but we will fight. And that's what differentiates us uh, from them. And as a result of that, because the Jews would not fight, that's why Allah forbade them to receive any of the spoils of war. That's also why Allah has forbidden them to take any right hand possessions either. So when the Jews go into battle, they can't take the spoils of war. They don't have right-hand possessions. But when we battle, we get the spoils and right-hand possessions. That's their punishment. 
So that doesn't mean that the spoils of war are bad and dirty. It's a punishment for them. That doesn't mean that right hand possessions are bad and dirty. It's a punishment for them. Huh. One prophet would walk with one man following him. Another would have just two men following him. Another would just have a small group. And then there were some who had no one following them. And then I saw a big crowd, small mountains filled with people. And I said, that's my nation. And I was told, no, those are the sons of Israel. But instead, look over there. And I looked and saw a huge crowd that blocked the skies. And it was said to me, this is your nation. And among them are 70,000 who will enter paradise with not even being held accountable. So this hadith here shows how, again, back in the time of the prophet, he didn't have that many followers. His companions, the original companions, were not that many. And like I told you guys yesterday in my class on the last hour, they were at war from the beginning of, of, of the prophet's mission until all of their deaths. They were in constant warfare. And to give them hope, the prophet Muhammad shared with them knowledge as to what would happen in the future so that they wouldn't lose hope. He said, we may seem at a, to be at a disadvantage today, but the day will come when we will outnumber everyone, even the Jews. Subhana Allah. So we have to have that hope. We have to have that hope. And he let them know that because of your faithfulness, our faithfulness to this religion, because even though we will go through issues towards the end of time, we will separate, we will fight each other, we will kill each other, we'll destroy each other. Even still, what we do will not be worse than what the people before us did. Okay? Because we are the best of all that Allah put forth. The problems we have will not surpass the issues that the children of Israel had and the Christians and the others. And when the prophet shared this hadith with his companions, especially the part about those 70,000 that will enter paradise without even being held accountable, the companions listened to that and they said, it won't be us because we were born in association of partners with Allah. But our children, they are the ones who will be of those 70,000. And that's when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to correct them. That shows how the companions, they really were going through a hard time. What they thought that those 70,000 would never be them. Because we, a lot of us were born Kafir. The prophet let them know that's not true. He said those 70,000, what makes them stand out over everyone else is not the fact that they were born Muslim. No, these were people who believed in Allah. They trusted in him. They were so strong in their belief that they didn't even do rukia over themselves. How many of you do rukia? You ain't of these 70,000. He said they were so strong in their faith that they didn't do incantations. How many of you do incantations? You ain't of this group. They were so strong in their faith that they never practiced cauterization. They simply trusted in Allah. They depended in, on him. And most of them will be you from my generation, he said. Not your sons. The majority of them will be from my generation because faith will become weaker and weaker with each generation of Muslims. 
He said, those of you who are with me, those of you who are closer to my time will be stronger in your faith and practice than those who come later who have never met me. This is the whole hadith I'm giving you. This is just part of the hadith. I'm giving you the whole hadith now. Okay? So that's why Allah says in the Quran that of those 70,000 that will enter paradise, most of them will be from the early generation of Muslims and only a few from the later generations because as each generation progresses, we will become further and further and further away from the truth. Those companions were the strongest Muslims ever. No one living on this planet today is stronger in their faith than those original companions were. Okay? Also, we have to understand that just as Allah has told us that what makes us stand out over the other people is the fact that we enjoin the good and we forbid the evil. He also made it an obligation upon us saying that it is not the duty of the practitioner of enjoining good and forbidding evil to deliver the message to everyone in the world. And this is what I want to emphasize because a lot of my students, a lot of you now have been listening to me over the past months. Your faith is strong. You want to share this knowledge with everyone. But I want y'all to understand nowhere does a law say that you have to deliver this message to everyone in the world. Even the prophets of a law didn't have to do that. Instead, what is required of us is to make it available to those who are seeking it. Do you sisters understand what I'm saying? What we see the Muslims doing today putting up tables in the middle of the street, calling themselves giving dawah, street dawah. This is not Islam. This is not what we have to do. Muslims running around knocking on the doors like Jehovah Witnesses and LSD, LDS people passing out pamphlets. We don't do that. That is not our job. Our job instead is to make the, the truth available to those who come seeking it. If a sister at the mosque come to you and ask you, sister, is this haram what I'm doing? Then you share it with her. But do you have to go up to every sister in the mosque and point out what you think they doing is haram? No. Y'all understand that? And once you do share the message to a person that has come seeking it, then you've done your job. The rest is on them. You don't keep throwing it up in their face. Is this clear? Okay, so I want you brothers and sisters to understand that because that's where the lines become blurred. We're living in the days in which Islam has become blurred because Islam has become strange. You got Muslims doing street dawah, which is not a part of our way of life. That's the part of, of the Christians, not us. You got Muslims banging on doors, passing out pamphlets. That's not us either. That's the Christians. You got Muslims riding on bicycles, stopping people at the mall, asking them what their religion is. Do you know about Islam? That's not us either. Those are Christians. We only make the knowledge available to those who come seeking it. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Listen to what the prophet 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he said, whoever of you sees something wrong being committed, let him change it with his hand. If he's unable to do that, then with his tongue. And if he's unable to do that, then with his heart. That's what enjoining the good and forbidding the evil consists of. So if you are living, for example, you're sitting outside on your porch, you see a child riding his bike in the street. You know that if that child does not get out the street, a car can hit him. So if you're able to run out in the street and save him, you do so. If not, then you yell out, get out the street. Get out the street for the car hit you. But if you look up and see a car getting ready to hit a child and you know there's nothing you can do, you can't run out there, it's too late. Even screaming out is too late. Then you make do. Oh, Allah, let that baby survive. That's the sequence we follow. That is the sequence we follow when it comes to enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. If I can stop it physically, I do so. If I can't stop it physically, then I stop it with my tongue. If I can't do it that way, then I make do it. It's when we fail to do anything that Allah will punish us. Let me make another example. I just said earlier, it's not the obligation of us to go around putting up booth tables to force the information on people. We're only obligated to give it to those who come seeking it. What about the mosque? You see a sister dressed incorrectly. Do you just ignore it? Well, there's a criteria we have to follow. This is the criteria. You can approach her physically. But of course, if I approach her physically and grab her and shake her and say, a stop for law, you're going to hell. I'm going to cause more harm. Or you can approach her in a nice way verbally and say, by the way, sister, you look so beautiful today, but you know, I'm gonna show you the way that Aisha used to wear her hijab. You could do that. Or you can make dua for her. Well, we're gonna go into detail about that because when it comes to enjoining the good and forbidding the evil like that, there are certain criteria we have to follow. We have to look at our relationship with that person. We have to look at how that person may view you. And we're going to talk about that because that's where the problem uh, comes with us as a nation. We call ourselves and joining the good. We call ourselves forbidding the evil. So we approach people with our tongue, but then we end up doing more harm than good we end up realizing that we shouldn't have said anything to her, that maybe it would have been better if I just prayed for her. So that's what we're gonna speak about when we meet for this class again on Thursday. We're gonna speak about what is considered maruf, which means the right. And we're gonna speak about what is considered mankar, which is the wrong. Because a lot of times we go to approach Muslims and tell them that they're doing something wrong and we are the ones wrong. We don't know the religion well. And that's another criteria. You know, before you enjoin the good, before you forbid the evil with anyone, you got to make sure that you know what the good is. You got to make sure that you know what the evil is. You can't go telling some sister that it's haram to wear fingernail polish. You can't go around telling a sister that it's haram to, uh, that your prayers are not accepted because she has on fingernail polish unless you can bring the dialogue.